Hello, John. <laughs> Here we go. Rock and roll. Morning, people. Morning. There you go. It's all up from here. USA. Larry and I have been working together for about the last 12 years now, and anything I've ever needed as far as recruiting, training, Larry's been right there. Um, Larry's got me salespeople, he's got me managers, he's got me technicians even through the toughest times in the industry, and he is just the kind of guy who's going to tell you exactly what's on his mind, he's going to tell you exactly what he thinks. But Larry also has the expertise to back it up. When he was in the dealership world, he was a top performer. And that's really important to my staff, uh, especially as it pertains to training. A lot of people can come in and teach out of a textbook, but Larry has a real world experience dealing with customers, dealing with situations and dealerships that we go through on a daily basis and try to train on. But Larry's been through it, so he can really empathize with the people and tell you what's worked for him and maybe what way not to go. Um, Larry is just always at a 10. I mean, his energy level is always up there. And I think people, they just love that and they feed off of it. Um, he's not faking it. He, he is genuinely excited to come in and help you. He's excited to come in and help grow your business. And he's one of those people who just really enjoys seeing dealers succeed and um, have a lot of fun at the same time. Life is about connection. Having a support system to lean on. And roads to endless possibility. At every turn, guiding the way, we are building the connections that move you. What would your dealership feel like if your entire sales staff was literally on fire, your sales and service staff, they were nonstop all over social media, completely dominating your marketplace. They could do it in 30 days or less and then continue their education to do it for an entire six months or a year. You literally would completely take over the entire marketplace and no one would be able to compete with you. And that's what we can do for you. So when you're walking around your community, whether you're at local restaurants or you're going to the gym, you don't want to be bothered, fine, you won't be bothered. But a lot of people will walk up to you and say, oh my God, I love your social media. Your staff is amazing. We love what you're doing in the community. We want to come buy a car from you. We want to get an oil change at your dealership. Your community is absolutely going to love you. And it doesn't matter what platform you're on. You could be on TikTok, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, all social media platforms. You will literally be all over the place. And not only will you have ads running, but your own staff 
is going to be promoting your brand and promoting themselves within the dealership and within the business. So it's like running an ad times a hundred fold because your entire staff is participating in the process. I've traveled all over North America. I've trained Toyota. I've trained Nissan. I've been to driving sales. I've been to women in auto. I get hired as a speaker for conferences at universities all over the country. And I can help change the trajectory of your dealership right now. There you go. Good morning and welcome. Uh, just so you know, we are doing a number of these hats. So anyone on the show, if you want a color, we're going to have four colors available. So they will be blue, red, white, and black. So I should have them um, later this month. So I will reach out and colors will up to you. All right. So I picked a couple books. It was a little hard to find books I found that were uh, pertinent. Um, so what I did was I found a few uh retail therapy why the retail industry is broken and what can be done to fix it retail apocalypse and resurrecting retail so go ahead jeff well hello good morning everybody welcome to the auto hub show on a new month and uh, for us canadians another month of discontent with uh, carbon tax increases and uh, and everything else and we're saving the planet uh uh one ridiculous tax at a time so uh <laughs> For those of you in the States, be thankful you're not in Canada because we're paying about eight bucks a gallon for gas today. Um, but the views and opinions uh, shared today are those of our guests and not necessarily that of Ian Nethercott or Jeff Polo or the Auto Hub Show. For a full description, go onto the website and take a look. Fantastic. So the, today we're talking about the end of automotive as we know it. That's the topic. And I'm going to start with Jeff and his opinions. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, you know, I'm a... I'm kind of an opinionated guy, and I've got some uh, some very interesting things there. But I've also made some connections. At last, uh, uh, in the falls, NIADA, we met some people from Tao Che Chan, which is the Chinese um, uh, version of. Uh, I'm not really sure. Maybe they're Amazon. Maybe they want to be. Uh, you know, just a mega dealer group, but they, you know, they represent, what'd you say, Ian, they had 75 dealers like yeah. in one big city or something? Yep. Yeah. And, um, but I've got some news today before I get on to them. And very big news today came out that starting in Phoenix, you will be seeing this gentleman driving his NASCAR <laughs> race car. Yes, that's true. Our friend Grant <laughs> is now going to join the NASCAR world. And you can see that this is legitimate. Don't think this is a total April Fool's thing. That car was, that. I actually saw it running around the Xfinity track. And so Grant at 67 years old thinks he can win races by applying his 10X uh, philosophy. He's gonna bring to racing what he's brought to automotive uh, sales, healthcare, <laughs> financial planning, Australian real estate and widgets. <laughs> Nobody's commenting. No one's hey. commenting. Shocking. No, one, no one's commenting. Yeah, the other you thing that I the, the other thing that I heard on the, the weekend. One, yep. The next one came from Tao Che. Okay, go ahead. Announced today that they that our friend Mr. Musk, Tesla, has bought Buick and is going to build Buick's all EVs in China <laughs> and ship them over here. That's the first card that's coming out. <laughs> they made a deal. B, uh, Buick is not profitable in North America for uh, for GM. It's hugely profitable in China. In fact, Buick in China is the choice of the elite. And I'm actually not joking. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tro Troy and Doug, you probably have all the all the stats that show that. If you if you really made it in China, you don't waste your time on it on a Mercedes, a BMW, a Geely S7, or whatever. You buy a Buick. <laughs> And that ain't your grandfather's car. <laughs> no, you don't believe me. Fine. <laughs> the heck with you. Now, the other thing I need to tell you is this. Is, are we all aware last week of Homeland Security going to see somebody's house or houses? Yep. Yeah. Or planes or something like that? Well, this has actually reached that level of politics and entertainment <laughs> and here's the connection travis kelsey donald trump taylor swift 
Melania, and Diddy are all implicated. <laughs> as you can see right there. And the woman down below is actually Jeffrey Epstein's personal assistant and actually took all of them to the island. By the way, I wish I had that sound of the ticker tape. <laughs> and there is the news for the day. I Fantastic. Guess Fantastic. Yeah, and, and it's <laughs> funny because uh, I was uh, I spent last week, and I don't know if everyone's aware, but Honda is the first uh, OEM to fire a volley across their dealer body in, in Canada and, and also now in the U.S. So I went last week and I visited some local Honda dealers to get their uh, opinions on what it's like to have your profit margin cut 55% without even asking you immediately. So they were, they were not too happy. And supposedly there's a hot Honda meeting going on in two weeks uh, nationally to talk about this. But that's already happened in the U.S. as well. I don't know what the percentage is, but I'm actually trying to reach out to Mr. Benstock to get his opinion because we know he has no opinions on the manufacturer. Uh, hopefully I'll get some answers this week. But uh, what I was told by a dealer at Okotoks uh, was that their justification was electric cars. <laughs> The cost of electric cars was why we're cutting your profit margin 55%. And that uh, factor is already is going to happen immediately with the new pilot. As soon as the new pilot shows up, it's 55% less profit for the dealer. So is that pilot or prologue? Uh, no, the prologue, that was funny. So we were talking about EVs and they were talking about how that's why they had to cut the profit margin. Well, in Calgary, they're not going to see the prologue until 2026. Because uh, they're they're giving them to Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver, because there's no market in Alberta for EVs, so they're cutting their profit margin, but they're not delivering any cars, which I thought was kind of funny, but not in a good way. But what's your opinion? I mean, uh, go ahead, Jeff. I mean, you work for a Honda dealer. What do you, what do you think? Well, here's the funny part. I actually made a post when this thing first came out that uh, Honda dealers are now going to start going into the world of fees. They're doing some fees now through the pandemic. They did some fees, but not as bad as others. But pretty soon you're going to see the uh, the prep fee, the uh, the uh, environmental uh, enactment fee, uh, hot dog fee is one of my favorite ones because the bottom line is this: when you sell a fifty thousand dollar vehicle and your total gross margins two grand. What the heck are you gonna do? You know, that's the key here. What the, what are you gonna do to keep the doors open? Already, we all know that dealers survive on the money, on the support money, on co-op, on floor planning, on, uh, they get, uh, many brands give you money for, um, for brand, uh, brand identification. I remember I was with a dealer that was a Chrysler store, went to Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi gave him $600 a car for three years towards his renovation. Interesting. Not sold, bought. But what about an EV offset fee? What about saying, hey, we, we love the environment so much, just like the federal parties, no mentions name, no names mentioned. Well, we have to we have to fix the planet. So we, as a car maker, we got to make electric cars. So unfortunately, everyone who buys a gas car has got to pay more. Peter, <laughs> we, we, we've talked some of your favorite topic. What's your uh, what's your feeling there? Well, I, I, I've said many times before, I'm I'm not EV negative. I'm just I just feel that I I understand the marketplace. And that the max max penetration that I see is going to be maybe 20% in North America. Uh, they, there's a market for EVs. There's a market for, for it for sure. I've owned five of them. Uh, but I can't, I can't see a, a group turning around and pushing this on its dealership body and have any success. Did not, did Honda not see the fiasco that Ford caused itself and the challenges that it put, pushed on Ford when they demanded $1.2 million investments from the Ford dealers to remain a Ford dealer 
just for the EV models and then seeing companies like Galpin that had 760 day supply of mock es I just saw something posted on, on, on LinkedIn that was a must, a 2023 Mustang EMOC GT that had a MSRP of $58,000 brand new. They were selling for $20,000 to get it off the lot. Well, well, I have to tell you something though, Peter, something's, something's very wrong here. At uh, the auction Thursday in Vancouver, a 2023 Mustang GT Performance Edition sold for $54,000 Canadian. Canadian. So that's 17,000 American. If Doug would not stop being so shy and join us. Um, something's very wrong here because I'm watching Tesla's to dealer auctions bringing you know model threes are bringing forty five thousand bucks for just a dual motor nothing else well what so about either these things are being loaded onto carriers and shipped overseas or the used car people aren't getting it well, what about fisker well, I, I hear fisker now being sold for 20 grand used <laughs> yeah well here here's here's something here if if we look on it it all depends on the, the marketplace like if you go into certain areas of California, they're still commanding ten thousand dollars above MSRP. Like an iconic five was was showing a, a ten thousand dollar market adjustment in California. And now this is ludicrous. The the whole business is becoming ludicrous. And the, and this is one of the things that I'm 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 such a big proponent of. And, and Doug will concur with me is the one price model. Like, well, it's, there's nothing wrong with MSRP. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as it is a reasonable amount of money for the dealership to make money. Now, the actuaries got together and they, they, they figured it out. But when Honda turns around and hits a 55% market margin adjustment to the dealership, well, I'm sorry. That that is that's punishing. That that is in Canada we, we call it constructive dismissal, <laughs> and it, it will it will be. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna wipe out half our dealer mar our body by doing this, and then we'll readjust it. But what do you think the other manufacturers are gonna do? Do you think Toyota and Ford and Nissan? What do you think they're gonna do? I mean, obviously Ford well, made some mistakes, it. but. What, what do you think these other manufacturers do? I know CADA is already suing Honda, but the question is, you know, as a, as a manufacturer, but more importantly, as a dealer body, if I've got, let's just say 50 dealerships and some of them are Honda, you know, what, what, what are the other manufacturers going to do? What do you think? Does anyone want to chime well, in? Well, well, here, here's the, the, I did a study on Toyota in the GTA, third largest city in, in North America. Within half an hour's drive of Central GTA, there were 27 Toyota dealerships. 27. You can't say to me that that is a necessary amount of dealerships. They, they're over dealerships. And, and that's what happened to GM in the 2008 crisis. They were over dealerships. And so they had consolidation it's going to happen and this is this is the manufacturer's way of consolidating the dealership well i talked to a go automotive store about that the same thing so they they happen to own a honda store market which used to be one of the biggest honda stores in the country and i asked the manager i know very well general manager the same question so i said is this signaling a one price model for all the manufacturers moving forward and he he seemed to think to I me mean, he doesn't have skin in the game anymore because they're owned by go auto he used to be a part owner in the store but the, the question is, you know, is, is that basically where we're going? Are we going to that? It must be sold at this or above. And are the dealers going to gonna hold the line? But more importantly, they what are they going to allow? That. What do you mean? You have to understand there's legislation in Canada, and I'm sure in the U.S., that says they cannot fix prices. Toyota went through this in the 2000s. Toyota got sued, believe it or not, by dealers in Alberta. Really? 
um, and won. They won, and they were forced to back off the one price model. The silly part was, with one price, the dealers were more profitable than ever, ever. They still haven't reached that same level, it's just as far as variable profits. Yeah. Toyota's customer satisfaction has always been amongst the highest in the industry. It was even higher. People couldn't go dealer to dealer. In fact, they went so far as the dealer had to get three quotes for the trade-in for the customer. Really? They couldn't negotiate on the trade. So, but they got their butts handed to them. And, you know, my belief, actually, I have to switch this because I, I just did a little bit of research while I'm here. Did Ford really suffer? Uh, Peter and everybody did Ford really suffer in our opinion they did in our own little world as car people they did oh they had to backtrack on this old blue oval whatever it was Ford blue and the 1.2 million I just looked it up do you know what their gross profit was in 2023 no idea 25.6 billion dollars was an 8.37% increase year over year for 22 from 2022. So I bet that Mr. Farley and Mr. Kazuhiro Takazawa have had a lot of conversations about this. Because you know, we in, in retail automotive, we all follow the philosophy of asking for forgiveness rather than permission. Would we all agree with that? Yes. Of course we would. So in this particular case, he said, guys, I'm really sorry. Hey, my EVs aren't selling right now. We're really sorry. By the way, I just got a $25 million bonus because, boom, I am brilliant. And I think there's way more to me afoot here. And again, here's Jeff Quasi, Mr. Conspiracy Theory. There's more afoot here. Because what they're doing is they're going to negotiate a change to their dealer compensation plan, their markups, everything. That's what this is. This is the first shot over the bow to oh, renegotiate. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we went, when you... If, if you go back mm -hmm. and you go back, Ford has done this six times in its history. Six times. The last time before this was with Nasser and Nasser trying to create the PAG group. And he, he wanted to go to the agency model and that was his plan. And he... Unfortunately, he got pushed back off of it, and he got pushed back off of the PAG group, and, and it basically almost bankrupted the comp company because of, of the not being able to follow through on what he was doing. But the, the whole issue is they are absolutely trying to regain control, and that's the problem with this business. It's all about control. The dealers want control, the OEMs want control, and the customers want control. But who actually has the control in the end? The sales <laughs> people. <laughs> <laughs> it's the customers. Yeah. Customers have the control. So, so, it, so if customers feel that they're getting the same price, whether or not they can make that happen, if dealers are saying, listen, I can't move the price because they cut my margin, even if that's not legal in certain places, is the customer going to then stop negotiating? That's the big question. No, no, never. Toyota's experience was that people did not stop the negotiation. It was only when, initially, it was only when, to, when they went to three or four dealerships did they discover the price was the same. And, and then it became collusion. Then it became collusion. But again, it was dealers in Alberta, apparently. I think in Southern Ontario that said, we don't, you know, they didn't do this so they could negotiate. They wanted to charge more. Yeah, but so but that, today that people only board, visit one they dealer. To charge more. But today people only visit one dealer. So if the manufacturer holds the line and says to the dealer, "Listen, we're cutting your they profit," only physically deliver to visit one dealer. But if you take a look, and I mean, hey Troy, you're from the you're from the next closest thing to the mothership in this industry. You guys probably have all the data that shows how many times they click on how many, I mean, how many different dealerships. What do you think? Well, you know, what I'm going to say is, is there's a bunch of correct statements here and that they physically visit one store. They do price shop. But let's face it, if they were going to do a one price model, um, MSRP and hold the line, and they were going to, I mean, I'm in sales, which, you know, 
I would take a spin on that and say, hey, we're making it easier on the consumer so you don't have to negotiate. I would market the crap out of it. So is there is that really the goal? I'm not so sure. Um, when we're talking about you know the the broader view of changing the um, profit margins for you know to to offset, okay, we tried agency model. A couple manufacturers got blown out of the water, so we're going to pull back on that. Now we're just going to adjust the profit margins. Um, you know, there's if you think about one thing about dealers is that they're incredibly resilient, and anything that gets thrown at them, they'll adjust and they'll find a way. Um, a service package a friend of mine just bought a used uh, certified used uh, GMC pickup and the prepaid maintenance on that truck was $4,500. Wow. Now, if you assume that that includes your standard maintenance package plus um, lube oil filter for let's say three years, um, I don't know what else is getting done on those vehicles, but I can't remember a basic service on a Silverado being eighteen hundred bucks. So there's a profit margin in there somewhere, and, and you're still going to pay shock supplies and uh, well, and all those the, other ones. Yeah, I mean, a little more out there should be done in point four. You're going to charge it out at one point oh. There's your six, you know, sixty percent margin for time. But at the end of the day, they will find a way elsewhere to make that money. And so, you know, this is, I think it's, it's upsetting because many of my customers are Honda dealers and I don't like seeing them upset, but at the same time, it's, a, it's going to be an adjustment and you're right. I think other dealers will follow through or dealer uh, OEMs, excuse me, will follow through with similar stuff. Um, I was just reading an automotive news this morning that, you know, Ford loses money on every single EV they sell. And you know, talking about the mach earlier, yeah. they want a 20 grand of a, uh, instead of 55. Well, they're losing money at 55. So, you know, at some point, someone's going to have to pay for that. And it's either going to be a parts manufacturer, the OEM in the production, or the dealer. And they're starting with the dealer because they know they can't sell that thing at $70,000 to actually make any money on it. So, you know, I think this whole EV thing is, is getting learned. Things will shake out. Things will change. Um, but dealers are resilient. They'll find a way to make money if it's not in the not in the front end. They'll make it in the box or they'll make it in fixed. Well, it's funny. I funny you bring that up because I also talked to a salesman I used to work with about compensation because that was the other thing that sort of came up in my mind when I heard this, which is okay. We cut the profit margin on the car for the dealer. The dealer then has less money to share with the salesperson, and obviously, if it's a flat price, that's fine. But what are they going to do to? change the pay plan to drive the right performance, but more importantly, how are they gonna drive more volume? Because if I'm making less per car, even if I add hot dog fees, I still have a 55% cut in my overall revenue. Even if I add fees, I'm not gonna make up 55%. Um, so what do I do with my sales staff? So I talked to a buddy of mine and he said, not only have they cut the commission on every new car sold, They've cut the commission on every used car sold because what they're trying to do is figure out how to how to balance that out. So if I make more on used cars, I make you know less on new cars. If I balance that out, maybe I can make it work. Uh, which I thought was interesting. Here. So so I'm sorry, Ian, but so so did he also follow that out with uh, how can I find good salespeople? Well, that was the funny thing. So I said to him, I said, how many salespeople are saying I'm out, dude? Like you're cutting my pay plan by 30%. I'm just out. So that's the other question is if I'm someone who say was at a Honda store for 10 years and I actually going to call my buddy uh, uh, Dylan in uh, Winnipeg is the top Honda salesman in Canada, or at least used to be. And I'm going to ask him, I said, you used to sell hundred cars a month and you were making X. What happens when they cut your pay plan by 30%? What do you do? So that that's the big question is, you know, how do I make that up? But more importantly, how do I keep my staff? If I've got a good salesperson, who's been there a while and is good at what he does or what she does, how do I keep them happy? But more importantly, how does that mean maybe moving revenue from the finance office, which you all know is the big revenue source for a dealer to maybe compensate the salesman? Shocking idea. I don't know. I'm not sure how that's going to go. So it's definitely well, going to be interesting. I, go ahead, Peter. Well, there's, there's two things I want to, I want to talk about here and I'm going back to, the original thing about how much money a, a manufacturer loses on a car, especially with Ford. If you look at well, Ford's 
number one selling car in North America was the Taurus. Great Before Taurus. that car ever left the factory, it lost two hundred dollars. Ever ever left the factory, and and it was a profitable car for them. They made up all their money on the back end of that. That now you got to remember, it's losing two hundred dollars leaving the factory. Now they have to pay for incentives. Now they have to pay for warranty. How much more money did they lose? But it was from the three year to the nine year point is where they made all their profitability in that car. It was a design process for them, and that was that was that was actually released by William Peterson, who who was was president of Ford in his book called quality is job one. Now, in moving forward into the, the sales side of things, and when, when you remove that kind of profitability from, from the dealership area, yes, you're going to have migration of individuals out of it. And that's why I'm, you know, over the next little while, I'll be talking some right up Doug's alley, which is the one price, one, one, person model and that includes eliminating two positions in the dealership which i feel are absolutely redundant and that one is the the desk manager and the second one is the f and i office if you remove those two positions in the dealership the dealership will become much more profitable because you do not need them if you operate in a business that is, even with negotiations, you do not need them. And, and you, if you eliminate them, that's where the margin is going to be restored back to the dealers. And having, having that one price strategy, or even like when I set up and using CDK, I, I, used, I used the 180 accelerated program for almost 20 years. We set up our salespeople to have a negotiating room that they didn't have to come to the management. And, and they, they sat there with the customer. And if the customer wanted a deal, they said, hey, you know what? This is, this is what we can do. And they used the computer as the trust factor. Now, this is, this is something that's going to go forward in, in, this, in this new Reset the great reset as as Jeff and I coined it years ago or a year and a half ago and, and said the great reset is going to change the dynamics of this business. And I believe it is. Doug, what do you think? Uh sorry, I, I was late hopping on. I was on a phone no call. Um, so we're talking so about Armageddon in the car actually. business. Armageddon with that? Armageddon in the car business. Honda fired the first volley, 55% cut in profitability for dealers in Canada. And the numbers in the US aren't good either. So dealers are not happy. But more importantly, if I'm a, a dealer principal or a dealer group and I have a couple Honda rooftops and I cut profitability by 55%, my next move is to cut pay plans for salespeople because I don't have the revenue. And I talked to a salesman last week and a couple Honda dealers in my market. And the salesmen are like, yeah, they cut our pay plans across the board. New use doesn't matter. It's so the question is, you know, will those salespeople move because they're now making a lot less money? Probably, they probably will. I think to uh, to what's probably been said already is that you're going to have to get creative. Um, I would augment what Peter said just a little bit. Going to a one-person model, while it does. Uh, reposition a finance manager to another role within the dealership. Um, and it eliminates that the need for that income producing, revenue producing position because I've got salespeople doing it. Peter, in most cases, you still need a sales manager or a desk manager because candidly, uh, they still need to be coached. Until they can do absolutely everything on their own, uh, you still need somebody behind the behind the screen coaching them and helping them and advising them. So you still need that position. It's just redefined. Ultimately, if you get everybody gin and yeah, it works. But the overarching thing is, yeah, dealers are going to have to. I mean, if if Honda's move is just the blatant move, other OEMs are probably thinking about it and maybe doing things in a little bit more subversive manner. And dealers are going to have to take a look at 
revamping how they're doing things, whether it be pay plan, whether it be operationally, or what have you. And that doesn't mean that they're going to not be profitable. It just means it's time to take the blinders off and get outside of your box and look at different ways. Exactly. But what I, I was saying Doug, is that most dealerships that have desk managers have sales managers as well. And it, 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 it's a double uh, it, it doubling up on what the position should actually be. A sales manager. I mean, it's, the thing is, is their model is let, let's not kid each other. A lot of dealers have a, a floor guy, girl, they call a salesperson. Then they have the desk manager, sales manager, whatever term you want, which is basically the closer. Then you got the desk manager, sales manager, which is the person um, uh, authoring the numbers. And so that model's a bit askew. On this topic, though, of a one-person thing, okay. when you've got a Honda dealer, um, Doug, in the U.S., what is the what's the average? Uh, monthly sales of a Honda dealer, give or take, in your opinion. New, new cars? New cars. I don't know, 100? I don't know. I, I really don't pay attention to hey, that. No problem. Uh, Troy, thoughts? How many? I would say, you know, well, I mean, it's so hard to say because there's stores that sell 1,000 a month and stores that sell 100. So, you know, I, I would say round numbers, probably 200 across okay. the U.S. So, so let's use the example of 200. Okay. How it, 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 Doug, you're actually probably the most expert person on this whole idea right now on this panel today. Okay. How long on a one person model from point of contact to delivery uh, should that person be with a one person or would a customer be with a one person? Assuming middle of the road, not cash purchase, don't do nothing, don't buy nothing to the to subprime from that end, right in the middle. Sure. Well, let's, let's 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 bifurcate the purchase experience. The first half of it you really can't control, which is customer wants to test drive two or three cars, sure. what have you. But let's assume they've committed to a payment. Okay. In most cases, in a one-person model, they're done. They're out the door within an hour at the longest. Sometimes within 15 minutes. It depends on the credit structure. Because what can happen is in a one-person model. As opposed to waiting for the long line of people to get into F and I, and I've got two finance managers and I've got 10 deals, we can actually have 10 deals drop all at the same time by 10 different salespeople, and it's all done. So okay. yeah, half an hour to an hour. Let's call it that. Let's say so let's say an hour just because we can always argue that they're tough finance. Then you sure. got from the initial greeting to a person that's done their done their research online and they test drive, et cetera. Can we say, you say two to two and a half hours? Generally, we see transaction times are cut in half. No, I understand that, but I'm just saying two to two and a half hours. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So let's go two hours. Okay. It is a Saturday. Uh, regular crowd settles it. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, and Saturday is still the day in most dealerships. Mm -hmm. So on a Saturday in a suburban Honda store, so we're not loading up to an urban store, you know, like uh, like Paragon Honda and to a rural store like Screw Bucketville, Arkansas Honda. <laughs> um, they're going to have probably 30 to 50 uh, customers opportunities through the door. Is mm -hmm. that Peter? Yeah, I would say that. Okay, so let's put that middle to 40. Okay. Of those 40 people, if they if if we take into account all the purchases. And everything and all the people that are there that don't make a deal, and I agree the closing ratio probably goes up with a one person touch. If we do put that to a 30% closing ratio of uh, 40 people, that's 12 people at two hours. Mm -hmm. That is uh, 28 people at who knows, but let's say an hour. How many people can you can you reasonably afford to have on? That will do it first to front to back. I'm not arguing for it. I'm just being a bit of a devil's advocate on so, this. I, I will jump in on this. I'll jump on on this. It's very simple and it's very easy to to look at the math. And basically, it it it's irrelevant 
And, and where I'm going to say it's irrelevant, it's just the change of process. And it's you either train someone to do it this way or you train so, someone to do it another way. And it's the process that you're training. And so the, the idealism of having a one-person uh, process, you're cutting back on the time so you can actually become more efficient. I had a store that would only book appointments on the 12 minute mark of the hour. You want, you want, you want in to get an appointment. It was on the 12 minute mark. And why was that? It was a mindset. We, we take 40, we take 48 minutes to convert a sale and it gives, gives us 12 minutes to reset. And that's what was told to customers. And that mindset was there. Now it could take you three hours to convert a sale, but the mindset was there that, hey, you have that, that focus point that you're you're actually in an appointment. And if if you do that and you recreate what is necessary in this business to be professional. And I don't care if you're one price store. I don't care if you're one person store. I'm talking about professionalism. And if you can create that professionalism, then price doesn't matter. And how many people you deal with doesn't matter. It's the experience that is going to change. But how many staff could you run with, though? That's the big question. If I, if I had a, a one-hour model, let's just say front to back, it's one hour. And I mm -hmm. sell, let's just say, 25 cars on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I need mm -hmm. F&I support because some of them have challenging credit to pick a random term. Mm -hmm. You know, how many people as a dealer, when I cut my front end margin by 55%, to use Honda as an example, how many people can I get by with and still be profitable? What's that number? What's that math? Like, what? That, what's the best practice? That was practice? where my question is. Yeah. How what many is people? It not, hey, because what? don't forget what we need for a one-person model is a solid professional, a knowledgeable professional. You know, I look at Russ moving his head around there. Um, you go to a service advisor, a service advisor that has a fixed ops background, a, a, an understanding of the operations of, a, of, uh, uh, of the actual techs does a much better job than somebody that's just a drone being doing their thing. And that's closer to a one-stop thing than anything else because they handle pricing everything. And that's my challenge. And I use the example of a Lexus store. Okay. Would anybody argue with me that of the brands out there right now, Lexus might be the closest as a brand to a one-stop shop short of the F&I? Because they handle yeah. their they handle payments up front. It's all straight and clear. They go on the website. They can say how much down. I can add it into the thing. They get everything. Mm -hmm. And Lexus stores on a Saturday can't handle the volume and so if you got 10 people just rounding up a number on a 200 car a month store 10 people handling stem to stern and it's all hands on deck on saturday except you're only going to get eight because somebody's got a wedding or somebody's got this or somebody's on holidays those eight people spend two hours with that with a buyer and that's ultimum the the, the ultimate thing where the heck are you going to handle the 70 people through the door? And how many people no, the, do you lose? The, I'm not arguing. I, I'm seeing that. That challenge is based on that we have always opened up the doors to a dealership as come as you be and we'll look after you. In Europe, it is an appointment only system in most, in most countries. Yeah, but we're not in Europe. It, I understand we're not in Europe, but here, here's the here's the challenge. We've we've allowed this business to go into the toilet, and that that's the end understanding. We're at a forty percent trust factor in this business because we've allowed it to operate in the manner it has. I've but actually I will actually correct that to say we have fostered it to be the way it is, and it's taken 60, 70 years. Correct, yeah. but in and when I when I ran dealerships in Europe, it was hey you had to make an appointment to get through the door, 
<laughs> I'm not laughing at you. I can picture somebody in Germany. You will come in at 10 a.m. You will be done by 10, 15 a.m. You will buy the car I'm telling you, and you will be happy. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty damn close to that in, in most countries in Europe because it's looked upon as a professional business. When I was in Europe, the salespeople, and, and this is unheard of, the salespeople had expense accounts. The salespeople had company credit cards. The salespeople had, had cars. The salespeople were expected to spend money on their customers. And, and when the person came in, the person got greeted by, they, they were basically like a doctor's office. They didn't get past the reception desk unless they had an appointment. And they were turned away. So it, it, if we can turn around, and again, that, that in North America, that would be deemed arrogance. In, in Europe, it's deemed professionalism. And, and the ch that becomes a challenge here. How do we blend this into uh, the new, new millennium of car sales? And we have the chance of changing this whole dynamic in the last three years. But what happens? As soon as inventory flows, it becomes a race to the bottom and, and dealers act upon fear. Who and, they turn, that? And, and, they challenge, and they challenge themselves because they say, oh, geez, the, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Well, 2019 was the, one of the best years ever in the car business. Well, 2023 will still be 30% higher in margin or 2024 will still be 30% higher in margin than we were in 2019, but yet the sky is falling and we, we have to challenge ourselves to actually recognize that. And that's where the problem lies with, with the mindset of dealers. And it's the dealers that do it themselves. And I know I get, I get, but, I but, get but again, hurt. Peter, it's about staffing. So, we know it's hard to retain staff. We know it's hard to find staff. We know we have math here involved. We know we have margin compression. We know it's less margin. We know we have more inventory. So if I'm a dealer selling 100 cars a month, how many staff mm -hmm. do I need to make it work? Like, that's the big let question me, let me I have. Let some facts for you guys. Yeah. What we've seen from the one-person mob because there's some yeah. speculation going on. Here's what we've seen. On average, the average salesperson in a one-person model sells about four to five more cars a month because of the time saving. So I get more productivity out of it. On average, turnover in a one person store is lower. And it's because of the culture change. The only yeah. way, if you're gonna go one person, the only way you can be successful, there's two things that are non-negotiable. One, everybody in management is bought in. If you don't have buy-in from everybody in management, you will fail. And two, the culture of your store has to change to one of coaching and accountability and empowerment. And if you don't do that, you will struggle yep. because the whole basis of success is on, we're developing our people to do more, do more, do more, do more, okay? The results are generally in a one person store, you'll see about a 12 to 17% drop in your variable comp, okay? That's the first thing you'll see. You'll see market share, you'll see repeat and referral go up. You'll see market share go up. It traditionally goes up. We traditionally see that price becomes less of a factor in a one-person model. Generally, even stores that we don't do business with that are one person, and we've, we've queried them, they said it's worth from three to five hundred dollars per car in additional gross. That people will pay that much more for that experience, all else being equal. Okay. And as far as attracting people, you're better off not getting anybody with any previous car experience. You are better off getting people that are process oriented, that have come from a system, whether it be bartending, hospitality, police, law enforcement, things of like that. You get people that are process oriented. And Peter has said this all the time. And you have a strong onboarding process. They will come in. They will hit the ground. They will be more productive than the people you have right now, right out of the chute. And over time, what you'll have is everybody's got their own business within the walls and the managers can kick back and watch. And that's why a store like Sean Subaru, that is the number one Subaru store in the world, can crank out hundreds of cars every month in a one-person model and not bat an eye. And when you walk into that store, 
it is so calm, you would think nothing's going on, and they've got 15 deals dropping right then. So how many staff, though? But that's the question. How many staff? I'm, I'm selling 100 cars, average store in North America, 100 cars new. And I, before that, I had, let's just say I had 8 to 12 salespeople. What's my what's right, my so cost savings from a staffing point of view? Like, how many, how many right, staff so do I need? You look at it. Yeah. You're still going to run, you know, back into, you know, the, the average salesperson selling, you know, 12 cars. Or do the yeah. math as far as how many salespeople you need. You generally need one processor in an F&I department for roughly every 60, 70 deals. Okay. So I need one person for every 70 deals just to do the paperwork. That's generally an hourly position. Yeah. And generally, we recommend that a team lead, which is what we call a sales manager, handles roughly seven to nine salespeople per team lead. And okay. That's how you break down your management. So okay. do the math accordingly. And, and then I would say I would say the average salesperson should be selling 20 cars a month. Under that, in, under that parameter, I, I would think that that you would have your salesperson average. You should have in that model with good people averaging twenty cars a month, but not an average salesperson. You know, we're looking here at, and I got to tell you something. I would kill for this. The closest thing I had to that was when I got in my Toyota store, and out of ten people, eight of them were pros, mm -hmm. and. They still struggled because it was not a, uh, how would I put it? They're very well trained, but I agree with you. You train them to do it right, they can do it right. But where do we get people that are going to want to do it right? Exactly. Even though they have a desire. Well, Honda dealers probably be a good place to get them from. <laughs> we're, we're looking in the wrong places to recruit our, our teams. We absolutely 100% are looking in the wrong places to recruit our teams. We're looking in the car business to recruit our teams, and that and that is the absolute worst place to find them. Because right at right off the get go, they have bad habits. They have learned. I agree. Habits. They have learned habits, not just bad habits. They have learned habits, and I and I will I will tell it. It's. We turn around and we say, based on the learned habits, this is how many people we need. We don't look at what someone can do if they have good habits. We, we look at, at the bad habits to, to understand what, what is possible. So if we turn around and, and we were, and I, I'll open this up to Russell too, because this, this is something I'm really passionate about is that when we take someone, and we actually train them properly, and we've taken them out of a different situation, like hell, Taco Bell spends more money on training people how to make a taco than we do on, on the process controls of a dealership. And, and, that, and that bugs the hell out of me because we're the number one retail business in the world, and we just fail. We fail, 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 and we fail at all different levels. And it's only a 20%, I would say 20% of the dealerships absolutely operate fluidly. So it's the 80%, it's the parental principle. So having said that, we can look at fixed offs. Fixed offs, and I've heard numbers, how many ROs a day can a person handle in a, in a fixed off situation? And, and the, the number that I keep hearing over and over again is 20. Well, that depends yeah. on the technicians, though. It's not about it's not about no, the front it, end. So what hours you have to sell? I'm, talk, I'm talking about a service writer. Yeah, but but the service writer, writer, it's all dependent on how many hours they can sell. How many technicians do you have? It's not all on the well, service I, writer. I did, I it's, not that, it's but, not that simple. It's not that simple. But that's that. <laughs> the, anyway, running down this this mindset is that how many how many how do you get a, a salesperson like a Jesse Campbell? Or your guy in in in, uh, in Winnipeg, or an Ali Retta, or in, any of these guys out there. The guy Cody from Texas that that sells twelve hundred, fourteen hundred. Well, that, it's about it's this. it's about How does, starting at a high level, but it's also about improving over time. I mean, I wrote an article about Dylan a couple of years ago. Now he sells roughly a hundred cars a month. He's a top Honda salesman in the country, and I will be reaching out to him this week. He did it over time. He started at 25 and he didn't know what he was doing. So he, he right. did it over time. You know, 
Go ahead. I, I do think that if you have, I do think that if you have somebody, like you have a culture of, of this one person model, there are going to be some low volume stores that will see an immediate benefit yeah. because they're going to have that benefit of, of the decreased cost of the F9, right? You're going to have a sales manager who's going to morph into a training manager, like Doug was saying, somebody who's going to be continuously trying to improve these people's skill set, make them more professional, make them better. I agree with that. In theory, you hit the nail on the head. It's a professional job. You have to treat it that way. Yep. Um, what I really think, though, is that the highest volume stores will have to adapt that one person model and say, OK, you've got someone like Dylan or Ali or, or some of these others that are selling 120 cars a month. Well, that guy gets an assistant because that person's bringing so much money into my store. I've got someone who's doing all my paperwork, getting all my credit apps run in the background while I'm having conversations. I mean, it's like any other business. If you're doing 10 car deals a month, you're, you can probably manage it on your own because you're spending a lot of time watching cab videos on YouTube. <laughs> but if you're doing 40, 50, 100 cars a month, you need a support system. And so I think it's not a one size fits all because to your point, flooding a floor with a bunch of air quotes professionals is going to be just as expensive is having some high paid, high compensated, but highly skilled professionals. And then some people on the lower end that are helping support those people that may work in as your bench strength over time, right? I, I think it's, I think there's room for it. I just not sure exactly how, how that's going to look, but we've seen it work um, in some large stores in the US. I know Sonic was playing with it for a long time. And honestly, as a salesperson, if I had somebody on my staff that constantly just had deals dropped on their desk that were guaranteed to close 100% of the time because all they had to do is some paperwork and maybe do some upselling, I think that person would be a little bit of bloat, just saying. Yeah, well, when I look at Dylan and I interviewed him and I look at his transition from 25 cars a month to 100, what's interesting is he really market? He really planned it out like a real estate team. So he's got a guy who does his appraisals. He's got a guy who does his deliveries. He's pre-selling the trade ins. I mean, he's really looking at it as a dealership within a dealership model. Now, this was something he was doing for many years, and he he pioneered it over time. But realistically, it's all about customers. It's all about how many customers can I sell realistically, and more importantly, how many cars can I deliver? And I need help to do that. So that that was really what got me. But the thing that was really funny about it was I wrote this article and then people call me like, this isn't a real guy. Yeah, he is. He's in a small town called Winnipeg. Now, he's not as big as Ali, but he's close. And he did it over years. It took him eight years to get there. But, you know, he, he grew his sales every year. Right. But the, here's, the, here's the thing. Professional dealerships out there have process control in place. They have Maybe. it in place. Like you, you look at, at, at some of the biggest organizations out there and some of the biggest, and some of the OEMs that demand it, like the salesperson doesn't ha handle the delivery process. They hand it off to a delivery specialist that's trained in every single model to sell, to go through it. What, what the salesperson or what the customer wants. You look at Volvo, Volvo sends out a, a, uh, a link to a delivery module and they choose what they want to learn about the car and it can be anywhere from a five minute delivery to a one hour delivery you you look at you look at porsche the porsche has porsche to pros so that that it doesn't take away from the sales process you you have all these different things that are out there and and it is truly it it's how do you want your dealership to run and operate and that and that is is the end end story? Do you do? Are you looking at the churn? Are you looking at the the transactional process, or are you looking at long term retention? Well, but but I help? think but I think that the the misnomer there, and it, maybe it's just my opinion, is professionally run dealership. It's really about constant improvement, and and that's really what he was doing. But anyway, we're out of time. So any final thoughts, Mr. Jeff? <laughs> hey, thanks. I thought it was a lively conversation. Uh, some of the best shows are the unscripted ones. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, just uh, for full transparency, uh, no, Doug, uh, Greg Cardone is not uh, is not uh, racing NASCAR. And Don uh, Melania and uh, Travis and the uh, trailer were not on, on Epstein's Island. And uh, we don't know about the uh, the, uh, the Musk and uh, Buick. Um, I'm going to be MIA for an undetermined period of time, at least one week, maybe three weeks. I get knee surgery next week, next Monday. And uh, so uh, 
I will try to log in. Def definitely not Monday because the next Monday at this time I'll be short of about four ounces of uh, bodily whatever it is. So uh, yeah. and, well, and set tell you what, Jeff. Four times knee surgery, you'll be fine. Yeah, and and send me four your hat times. color I choices. We've got four colors, so it'll be blue, black, red, and white. And send me an address, and I'll make sure you get one of these new style hats when I get them from Liz, which will be soon. And if you're going to uh, Baltimore for a soda, I will be there doing interviews live in person. And, and have yourself a great week. Um, please don't go over any bridges. <laughs> yeah, I there's a few. Light of it, it was it was a tragedy. But, you know something? It's uh... <laughs> so it, it's always my fear, Jeff. Hey, you got to watch out so, for those yeah. uh, so bad drivers. You combine a two hundred and fifty thousand ton boat. With a bridge? And that a bridge that's, that's, that's on four, three platforms, something could always go wrong. Thanks, guys. All right. All the better. Happy Easter. Happy whatever. Yep.